in, yes, you can actually sue people for their lies news, a person who claimed they had been sexually assaulted, but not so much, yes, we can sue that person for claiming they've been sexually assaulted because that's lies, lies that hurt me. And so we should, you know, not do the lies. So you made up a lie against me and told Yale about it, and Yale took action against me, and that hurt me, hurt my reputation, caused me damage, and now I'd like to sue you for the lies. So yes, we can sue you for the lies, so let's learn a little bit more about the lying liar who made up the story about the sexual assault and now actually being held accountable. Let's get started with this. A former Yale University student who reported an alleged sexual assault is not immune from a defamation lawsuit after the scale's handling, school's handling of the assault failed to meet legal standards according to the Connecticut Supreme Court. So can we sue this person? Already went up to the state's level Supreme Court. The court decision centered on a case in which a former Yale student accused a fellow student of sexually assaulting her in a dorm room in 2015. The student, who she claimed sexually assaulted her, was suspended and expelled. So, you know, I was going to Yale, you know, a fairly pre prestigious school. And because of your lies, I was suspended and expelled. And also, you know, kind of hard for me to get into another college because of that on my record. So you somewhat hurt me. But that person was acquitted of the charges and now is suing the university and the accuser of defamation because you sold, told me lies. The district court had dismissed the claims, saying that there was absolute immunity for the accuser. So the accuser apparently totally able to make lies up and there's nothing to do about it. But the Supreme Court decision, and by this we mean, of course, the state Supreme Court, the judges said that Yale's wide committee on sexual misconduct lacked adequate safeguards to ensure reliability and promote fundamental fairness for the hearing that disqualified it from being quasi-judicial. So yeah, maybe we'll have immunity if this is in accordance with due process. Because then you bring your, you know, your your complaint in a legal proceeding, and maybe that's different. Because there's no defamation in a legal proceeding, right? You can make up claims in a legal proceeding, and it's not defamation. Typically, that's the rule. And so, okay, this is a legal proceeding, or it's kind of like a legal proceeding. But the state supreme court said that Yale's process was so broken, so unfair, it didn't meet the basic minimum standards for fundamental fairness, which incidentally is pretty hard. It's pretty hard to fuck that up, to say that this is not fundamental fairness. You have to try, right? Because due process is a higher standard than fundamental fairness. So when we say fundamental fairness, this is actually less than due process, right? And it's sort of the baseline minimum that courts need to do, because there are some circumstances in which a person doesn't necessarily have due process. But most often, by the way, in immigration, in certain immigration cases, there isn't necessarily a right to due process in some of those cases. But even where there's not a right to due process, there's a right to what's called fundamental fairness. So you have to F up pretty hard to not get fundamental fairness. And from Connecticut, the Connecticut Supreme Court for Yale, for Connecticut to say that Yale, which, you know, is pretty, pretty blue leaning state. For them to say Yale didn't meet the standards of fundamental fairness, Yale must have really effed this up. What were they doing? Looking at chicken entrails or something? Holy shit. The Yale spokesman declined to comment on the ruling and how it might affect the university's disciplinary process going forward. Well, apparently, your process is so incredibly bad that it doesn't even meet the lower standard of fundamental fairness. Forget due process. It is so bad that it is lacking in the most basic considerations. And the Connecticut Supreme Court, a blue-leaning jurisdiction, holds this with respect to Yale, a very prestigious school. So I don't know, maybe consult your law school or maybe consult a different law school and on sort of this because it sounds like you don't know how to do even the very barest of bare minimums. The lawyer for the students said they were delighted by the decision, but they have a long way to go before they get justice. Yep, this is all about whether they can sue. Right, so we've had we've already had to go to the Connecticut Supreme Court on the issue of can I sue because of how well this is going. So yeah, the lawyer for the former student did not respond to an email request for comments. The Supreme Court ruling, and again, the state Supreme Court 
said that a student who made the allegations didn't testify under oath or perform any sworn st standard statement that failed to meet any sort of legal standard. According to the court's opinion, the student who was accused and their lawyer, because they were represented by a lawyer during the process, were not permitted in the hearing room and were not permitted to speak, raise objections, or cross-examine in real time and were denied their request for recording or transcripts of the hearing. So that's how bad the due process is, okay? So apparently, and we're, again, due process is actually technically the wrong term here. Due process is technically the wrong term because we're talking about fundamental fairness, which is actually a legal standard that does exist, and it's less than due process. It is, it's less than due process, okay? So fundamental fairness is just like the, the most basic of basic standards. All right, so what did Yale do? Okay, we're going to have a hearing. We're going to have a hearing on whether this male student assaulted this woman. Okay, how are we going to conduct the hearing? I have an idea. What if we bring the woman in to the room and we ask her what happened? Not under any oath, not under any sort of promise to tell the truth. And what if we exclude the guy and we exclude the guy's lawyer? They're not allowed in the room. Okay. They can't see the accuser. They can't confront the accuser. They can't speak. So they can't come into the room and talk to us. They can't present their side of the story. They can't raise any objections about what they say. They can't cross examine the witness or ask any questions. And they also can't get any sort of recording of it. We're not going to record the hearing. We're not going to record it or have a transcript in any way. So how about she comes in and tells us some things, not under oath. And how about you don't get to be in the room. Your lawyer doesn't get to be in the room. You don't get to speak. You don't get to raise objections. You don't get to cross-examine. And we're not going to record the hearing in any way. How about that? Are you beginning to see why this might meet, this might be a problem? With, this, with the basic bare minimum of fundamental fairness? Are you seeing some problems here? Apparently, Yale didn't see any problems with any of this. It's a shame that they don't have a law school that could have helped them out. Oh, Lord. Furthermore, there was no record of the proceeding because there's no record. So how about, how about, how about evidence? What evidence? There's no record. There's no record. We didn't record anything. There's, there's no, can we have a copy of the record? What record? Doesn't exist. Uh-huh. The decision came despite words from national sexual assault organizations that would discourage victims reporting the assaults. Because, you know, because women might, you know, not report assaults if they will have their story questioned or examined or reviewed or listened to in any way by any man who is part of it. So, yeah. A brief in support of the defendants by 15 organizations said victims won't be able to safely and confidently report assault in Connecticut if they can be held liable for engaging in legally obligatory reporting and disciplinary processes. Uh-huh. Um, well, uh, maybe don't make up lies. And also maybe due process is also a good thing. So, you know, um... Should you report your sexual assault? Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Should the school do something about it? Yeah, probably. Should we do, you know, anything that even affords the, the person being accused in any way of even the most basic of basic protections? Forget due process. Forget due process. Even the most basic of basic protections. No, we shouldn't do that. Uh, but that if we, if we had even the most basic of basic, victims won't be able to safely and confidently report their lies, because there might actually be consequences to them making them up. Despite any strong public policy interest in protecting students from discrimination, the organization said it can't be advanced if perpetrators can wield the threat of a lawsuit. Don't make up lies. See, the key, the key to defamation, right, is it's it, you can't sue for defamation if it's true. So just don't make it up. Don't make up lies. You know, it's like, you know, yeah, okay. And, you know, yeah. The brief report, the primary reason for not providing absolute immunity is a risk of false or malicious statements. No. And then adding these, 
Then the the organization over here who would like the women to protect to participate without any sort of review say that false accusations of sexual assault are exceedingly rare, and Yale procedures provide for discipline against those who levy them. But how though? Because how would how would Yale know that they don't that they occur? Because there's no ability to cross examine them. So false accusations of sexual assault are exceedingly rare. Well, the last statistics I saw on such an issue estimated that the risk of completely fabricated claims was somewhere between two and 7%. So we'll call it 5% because that's in the middle of two to seven, right? So that's one out of 20, right? One out of 20 isn't nothing. One out of 20 isn't, isn't nothing. There's, you know, it's, you know, you roll your D20 and it comes up one. So, you know, that's something. And maybe even if that's true, we should allow due process. Or how about even the, even the most basic of basic standards? So even if the guy is dead set guilty in, in our law, we still have criminal trials, right? Even if he's dead to rights, bang, dead, guilty, we still do due process. I know it's amazing, right? The state has you, the state has you in every possible way, eight different ways. You are going to prison, sir but you still get due process. So is it false? It doesn't really matter in some sense whether it's false or true because that's not the standard. The standard is how about due process or how about even the most basic concerns? But no, that's not good. And they say the risk doesn't outweigh the chance of putting a student in a sexually abusive environment. Uh-huh. So the, the risk of a person even being truthfully accused but getting absolutely no protections whatsoever Okay, it's not worth the risk of a student potentially being in a sexually abusive environment. These guys have a very strange, perverted sense of justice, in my view. I mean, why not just bring back summary executions at this point? You know, why you know why not just be like, yeah, you're dead, and just chop off their head? We could go back way old school. I bet some of these people would like that. The state supreme court said that while some kind of immunity might be appropriate. It's still early in the court process for the defendant to assert it. It said it could reconsider it later with a more complete factual record. So maybe, as the facts reveal, you'll be able to get immunity. But, you know, this sounds like some pretty big bullshit. The court writing, we must recognize there's a competing public policy that those accused of crimes, especially as serious as sexual assault, are entitled to fundamental fairness, which, if we're using that in a legally proper way, we mean less than due process, the most basic of basics. So if we're using the term fundamental fairness in its legally correct sense, which, you know, you would hope it is from a state Supreme Court, but I've seen weirder things in my time. But if we mean that, the most basic of basic protections before being labeled a sexual predator, how about we gave them literally the very bare minimum? How about literally the very bare minimum? <laughs> Noticing those who make accusations often face life-altering and stigmatizing consequences. You think? You think they were kicked out of Yale, you know, on a sexual assault complaint, probably not getting into college anywhere, probably going to have a tough time in their life and career, having some trouble moving forward in their life. Yale's over here like, we see no problem. We see no problem by letting the woman, by the hearing, being the woman comes into the room, she's not under oath in any way, she provides a statement, you don't get to be in the room, your lawyer doesn't get to be in the room, you don't get to object, you don't get to ask questions, you don't get an opportunity to speak at all, by the way. There will be no record, there's no transcript, there's no recording. I hope you enjoyed the process. That was the process. Star Chambers had more process than this. I mean, you know, geez, Lord. The student in question, who happens to be a native of Afghanistan, was accused of the assault during an off-campus Halloween party, but he maintains the intercourse was consensual. Even though he was found not guilty in the case and was eventually readmitted to the university, so nice on Yale to let him back in, the case attached acquired national attention. He was suspended again and expelled from Yale after accusations of another assault in Washington, D.C. So is that real? Is that a real assault? Or is someone just continuing to come up with him? You know, did someone else try to burn him? 
because you know that's the way things go. So what's really going on here? And also, I'm gu guessing that Yale's second exp expulsion, he's now been suspended from the school twice. Maybe we can go for three because it's going over just that well over here. He's seeking damages like $110 million for lost educational opportunity, intentional infliction of emotional distress, and, you know, lies. So, yeah. So, not clear whether or not he'll be readmitted to Yale for a third time and get that hat trick exp expulsion. I didn't even know that was possible, but that's what we're looking at right now. Thus, that brings us to the end of the story about a former Yale student who was accused of a sexual assault, who got, uh, well, they got something that Yale called a hearing, but has absolutely, you know, it's a little bit hard for it to be a hearing when literally they don't want to hear from you. But apparently it's a hearing. We're hearing other people though, but we're not going to tell you about it or let you understand it anyway. So that's real fun. And he has already been expelled from Yale twice because of these claims and Yale, you know, doing its thing. Maybe try to go to a different school, I guess. And he's suing for $110 million for the defamation. So we'll see what happens. So it's all sort of fun. And thus, that brings us to the end of discussion of that story.